forces in the subatomic world have a different character than we're used to when we hear the word force. For instance, when we hear the word force, we might be thinking about pushing a car or military might or maybe even these aren't the droids you're looking for. But in the quantum realm, forces occur when a particle carrying some kind of charge emits another particle transmitting a force. I made a video about quantum electrodynamics, which is the theory of when a particle carrying electric charge emits a photon, and another video about quantum chromodynamics, when a particle carrying the strong charge emits a gluon. But in this video, I'd like to talk more about the strong charge. It turns out to be more complicated than the familiar positive and negative charges of electromagnetism. So how did people figure this all out? It all started back in 1964 when Murray Gelman and George Zweig independently proposed what we now call quark theory. We know a lot more about quarks than they did back then, but they proposed that there were three types of quarks with the names up, down, and strange. Each quark was a fermion, which means that they carried subatomic spin and that there were only two kinds of spin, plus a half and minus a half. Protons and neutrons, which are examples of a class of particles called baryons, each contain three quarks. Protons contain two up quarks and a down quark, while neutrons contain two downs and an up. But beyond the fact that baryons contain exactly three quarks, there were no rules on which quarks could exist in a baryon. So that means that all other configurations should exist. They're listed here. Up, up, up. Up, up, down up, down, down, and down, 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 for example. And then there are the ones containing strange quarks, like up, down, strange, etc. In fact, when the quark model was proposed, the configuration strange, strange, strange hadn't been found. However, less than a month after the quark theory paper was released, the omega minus particle was discovered. The omega minus particle was a particle with three strange quarks. Things were looking good. There was a problem, though. There is a principle of quantum mechanics that governs the behavior of fermions, which is what quarks are. This rule is called the Pauli exclusion principle, named after Austrian-born physicist Wolfgang Pauli. What Pauli's principle says is that it is impossible for two identical fermions to exist at the same place. This, by the way, is why electrons surround atoms in the way that they do. If Pauli was wrong, chemistry would be enormously different. So what does the exclusion principle have to say about quarks? Well, suppose that we have a baryon with three of the same kind of quarks, say up, 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 for example. From an exclusion principle point of view, having three up quarks in the same place sounds ominous. But spin helps us. The first up quark could have a spin of plus a half, and the second could have a spin of minus a half. The differences in the spin make the two fermions different. So, so far, so good. But now, Let's add the third up quark. No matter if it's a spin plus a half or minus a half, it will duplicate the spin of an existing quark. And, according to Pauli's principle, such a particle cannot exist. Yet they do. With the discovery of the omega minus, all the possible configurations of three quarks in a baryon had been found. So either the quark idea was wrong, or someone needed to work out an answer. In October 1964, an American physicist named Oscar Greenberg, although he prefers to be called Wally, supposed that perhaps each quark had another property that we now call color. Color, by the way, is the name that we use for the strong force charge, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Color would then come in three varieties. Quarks would have color, but particles like protons would not. Thus, we need to somehow invent an idea where if we added three different things, they would cancel each other out and effectively add to zero. That's like adding a positive and a negative number and getting zero, but with three things and not two. Luckily, there is historical precedent for such a thing. In 1861, legendary physicist James Clark Maxwell was working with a photographer by the name of Thomas Sutton. They were playing around with colors and light. They found that if they projected a red, blue, and green light on a wall, that the combined colors looked white. Taking this analogy, we now name the colors of quarks, red, blue, and green, and take as a metaphor the color white as having no color. In the context of the quark model, we now can have three up quarks or three down quarks or three strange quarks. 
Since each quark has a different color, then no two quarks are the same and the Pauli exclusion principle causes no problems. Proving that color is a real thing is rather tricky and has to be done indirectly. It boils down to assuming that there are three different quark strong charges and seeing the implications of that idea. When we do that, we find that we can explain all the data involving quark interactions. So scientists are now very confident of the color idea. The invention of the idea of quantum color is a pretty interesting story. Prior to the quark model, physicists were discovering all sorts of particles without any sort of unifying idea. The quark model was a piece of the tale, but the story was made more complete with the invention of color. And a little more work resulted in the creation of the full theory of quantum chromodynamics, which of course I've made another video about. But in this video, I want to concentrate on Wally Greenberg's epic idea that made the world a colorful place.